Here we go. Uh, today's sermon is titled, The Coming of the Holy Spirit. So last week we looked at the resurrection of Jesus, and after Jesus uh, ascended into heaven, he, he told the disciples that he's going to send them power from above. So we are going to look at this passage today and what exactly this means for us as believers today. This passage here in the book of Acts 2, uh, verse 1. So before we get started, uh, before I read this passage, the, the writer of this book is called Luke. So this is the second book he's writing here. Uh, this book is also addressed to a guy called Theophilus. Theophilus. And the word spirit in the book of Acts is mentioned 50 times. So when you read the book of Acts, you will see the word spirit or Holy Spirit approximately 50 times. So here we have Luke, and he's going to give us an account of how the Holy Spirit operated in the lives of believers and the early church. If you, if you have your Bible open, uh, it says the Acts of the Apostles, um, the heading of the book of Acts. But it should actually be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit through the Apostles because it's actually the Holy Spirit doing the work through the Apostles. So it's just something to, to keep in the back of your mind. As you read the book of Acts, uh, the Apostles and Disciples, it was not their own power. They did not do these things from their own works but it was the Holy Spirit that acted through them to do what God wanted them to do. It was power from above. So here in verse 1, we see when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your, your word this morning. God, I, I pray this morning that you will illuminate these, these passages to us this morning as we, we start here in the book of Acts that you will show us what this means and how we can apply this to our life as well. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you fulfilled your promise when you say that you are going to go to heaven and that you will send power from above to equip believers to do what you called us for. We thank you for this and thank you that we have this opportunity to preach your word, to talk about you, to worship you, and to praise you this morning. May we never take these opportunities we have on Sunday for granted, that we'll always be 
uh, thankful that we can come together here as the body of believers. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, quite interesting. When you, when you look at uh, Jesus, when he told the apostles or the, the disciples that he's going to send them power from above. He told them a few times in, in the Gospels that they would need to go and wait. So he's going to ascend to the Father, and then he's going to send them power from above to equip them uh, to do what he called them. And the most obvious one we find in Scripture is Matthew 28, verse 19. And this was Jesus' command to the disciples. And Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So we see here that Jesus promised that he will send someone so that they can go out and make disciples and baptize them. This could have not been done on their own. The disciples or the apostles had to receive power to, to do this, and this could only be possible through the Holy Spirit. So here in the book of Acts, and especially Acts 2, we see the birth of the church. This is where the church came into existence. When you look at the Old Testament, you will see that there was a synagogue, but it was only the priests that were allowed into the Holy of Holies. But when Jesus died on the cross, he torn the veil, and now God's Spirit is going to take up residence inside of believers. God's, res God's not going to dwell inside a temple made with hands anymore. He's going to dwell inside believers because we are also called the body of, body of God. The Holy Spirit dwells in, in you. Do you not know that you are a temple of God? We have this in 1 Corinthians. So, and for this, in order to happen, God needs to send or Jesus needs to send the Holy Spirit. So, the Holy Spirit dwells in believers today and it's the Spirit of God. Yes, we come together here on a Sunday. This is a church. But each one of us, where we are in the week, we have the Spirit of Christ dwelling in us. We have the Holy Spirit in us wherever we go. So, in the book of Acts, and especially when you read the book of Acts, it's a very very marvelous book to read, you will see that it goes from Jesus to the apostles, from the old covenant to the new covenant. So this is what's happening in the book of Acts. And especially the gospel is going to spread now from Jerusalem to Rome and eventually where we are today at the ends of the earth. And this is the primarily... This is why the book of Acts was written. Jesus also said in John 14, verse 16 to 17, And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. So even in the book of John, Jesus promised that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. Jesus also said in Matthew 16, verse 18, that he will build his church and that the gates of hell would not stand against his church. This all referred to the body of believers, to, to Christians. Jesus also said that we will do greater works than him. This was never greater works in power. Like I've said previously, we cannot raise more people from the dead than Jesus did. I cannot heal more people than Jesus did. I can never, I don't have that power. What Jesus meant was we will do greater works in witnessing because Jesus never moved outside of Jerusalem. His ministry only lasted three years. Today you have ministries that's been going on for 50, 60, 70 years. 
and how many people came to the knowledge of God through these ministries. So we can never do more things that Jesus did. Then why, why would I serve him? Why would, I, why would he be my God if I can raise more people from the dead than Jesus? It doesn't make sense. Jesus meant that we will do greater works, not in power. And this is why we needed the Holy Spirit to be witnesses wherever we go. So we see, um, and also Jesus said in Acts 1 verse 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So this was a promise from Jesus. And when you read the book of Acts, you see how it happened. You see, when, especially when persecution started, what happened when persecution started? The gospel started spreading. So when you read the book of Acts, you'll see eventually that the gospel ended up in Rome with the Apostle Paul and Peter. It eventually ended up in Rome. And today where we are, I'm not quite sure when we look at stats, if there's a country around the world that has never heard the gospel, I'm not quite sure. But I think we can say that probably most of the world heard the gospel already somewhere along time. So the background of the passage, we've seen that the disciples need to go and wait from power from above. Jesus told them in Acts 1 verse 4, go and wait, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise, Acts 1 verse 4. So yeah, the apostles went, they went to the upper room and they waited together and waited for this promise that Jesus told them to wait for. And quite interesting when you look, especially in the book of uh, the book of Acts, you'll see that the disciples they were baptized differently with with the Holy Spirit than we have today, because all believers at the moment of conversion, one Corinthians twelve verse thirteen, you are baptized with the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6 verse 19 says you are a temple of God. If I'm a temple of God, it means the Holy Spirit is living inside of me. So the, the first time you came to Christ, you've already been baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's when the work of regeneration starts taking place inside your heart. It's not an experience to seek, but it's a truth to acknowledge for Christians today. So let's quickly have a look. Who is the Holy Spirit here? Quickly. And the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's part of the Godhead. It is part of God. He's the third person. And we find our first reference of the Holy Spirit, we find in Genesis 1, verse 2. So all the way back to Genesis, you will see that the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. He's not less than God or less than Jesus. And they are all equal in power. Many times today people will make a mistake assuming that the Holy Spirit is a lesser form or a lesser spirit from God or is lesser in power than Jesus and God. He's equal with God and the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is also the life giver. We find this in John 3 verse 5. The Holy Spirit is the life giver. Sinners need to be reborn from above. And this is only possible through the Holy Spirit. The baptism water itself that does not save you. Water cannot save you. It's the Holy Spirit that regenerates you, that changes your heart. The Holy Spirit is also the advocate, we find this in John 14, verse 6, he's the one, he's an advocate for Christians. The Holy Spirit is also the sanctifier. He's the sanctifier. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3, he sanctifies us. He conforms us more into the image of his son. He's also the anointer. He's also the one that gives us power or empower us to do what God has called us for. And when we look, especially in the Old Testament, you will see, and I'm going to give you a brief description of times when the Holy Spirit came upon certain people. 
And the Spirit of the Lord was upon Otniel, and he judged Israel. This is all the way back in Judges 3 verse 10. The Spirit of the Lord came upon someone, equipped them for a time, and then would usually after the mission was completed, the Holy Spirit will depart from the person. But here in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit stays inside the believer. The Holy, the, then the Spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah, Jude, Judges 11 verse 29. We also had the Spirit of God was upon Saul. But also the Spirit of God also left Saul. When King David was anointed as king, the Holy Spirit left King Saul. And also Samson, the Spirit of God was also... There's just a few examples to show you that the Spirit of God was there from, from the Old Testament, from the beginning. And the Spirit of God was also upon Samson. That's why he was so strong. But unfortunately, the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit, also left Samson. When you look at Judges 16, verse 20, and especially that passage, a very, very sad passage, Samson did not even know when the Spirit of the Lord uh, departed from him. A very, very sad passage. And the Holy Spirit is also the illuminator meaning he illuminates scripture to us. He helps us to understand the scriptures so that we can apply it uh, in our own lives and that we can live this out. So this is just a brief uh, description of who the Holy Spirit is. So here in our passage today, we see that Jesus told the disciples to go and wait. And the number of these disciples or apostles were 120. So we had the apostles and we had some other believers that joined them in the upper room. Mary would probably have been there as well. Mary Magdalene, the, the women that followed Jesus, they probably were there as well. We know that Jesus uh, appeared to more than 500 people at once. It's been argued that out of that 500, only 120 went to the upper room. And this is the 120 people we have here. Pentecost, when you look at the word Pentecost, it was called the Feast of Weeks. So in Israel, they had some uh, festivals during the year, and the Feast of Weeks was also one that the people attended every year. And the Feast of Weeks also means first fruits. It means the first Fruit. So here we have everybody's waiting in the upper room. And then all of a sudden there was a sound of a wind. A sound of a wind. It was not an actual wind, but only the sound of a wind in the upper room. And when you look at scripture, wind is many times ascribed to the Holy Spirit. Especially when you look in the Old Testament. When you find the word wind, you will see it's many times uh, ascribed to the Holy Spirit. And also when the wind came, these tongues of fire appeared upon these believers up in the upper room. They were indicators or symbols that God has sent His Spirit to believers. It was also not real flames of fire. Also, indicators that showed God has sent His Spirit to the believers here in the upper room, just like the dove that descended on Jesus uh, at His baptism. It was not a real dove. It was a symbol that it came down on Jesus. So also in Scripture, fire, when you see fire, especially in the Old Testament, it's ascribed to God. It's ascribed to the presence of God. We know that Moses... Uh, in the burning bush, who spoke to Moses in the burning bush? It was God. Especially when you look at the Old Testament, fire is many times ascribed to God, and wind many times ascribed to the Holy Spirit. So these winds and fire were only symbols. It was not real fires or a real wind. It was only symbols that showed that God has chosen this 120 to give them his Holy Spirit. And this marks the birth of the church. And this is in many, and especially today, this passage can be interpreted very, very wrongly. And I'll do my best biblically to give you 
not my own opinions, but what scripture teaches about this, uh, what this actually means. So we see here in the passage in verse, uh, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So everybody there, the 120 started speaking in other tongues. So the word tongues, when you look at the Greek word tongues, it was known language. It's dialect, like we speak known languages today. So the 120 above in the upper room spoke known languages. It was not a mystical, strange language that the people in the room did not understand. It was a known language. We all speak known languages today. So the tongues were known languages. It was not gibberish or a new heavenly language. It was also not something that you needed to learn to speak or just believe to speak it. The Spirit just gave it. He gave the known languages. Today you find strange things. You, know, you need to learn to speak the, spirit, the language of the Spirit. There's no such thing. The Holy Spirit gave these known languages to the believers. And this is what happened in the upper room. How, let's put it in a practical way. How, how will it work today? Let's take an example. Let's say everybody here in church, everybody speaks Koreans. Sorry for my fellow uh, brothers and sisters from the Philippines. You are all speaking Korean now, this morning. Okay, so let's do it practically. So when we look at this passage, everybody in church here speaks Korean. So I speak English. And if I was standing here and God gave me the Holy Spirit, He will change my language to Korean so that you could understand what I was saying. And this is, this is what happened in the book of Acts. It was not these strange things you get all over today. It was a known language. So in practical terms, God will change my voice here, my language to Korean so that you all will understand what I was saying. And this is what happened here in the book of Acts. So why? Why did God, why did he let the people speak in these languages? And it's quite simple. These languages given by the Spirit were a sign of judgment to unbelieving Israel. This is why God let the people speak in other languages. It was to show Israel, you rejected the Messiah. You didn't believe in him. Now, all the nations all over the world, I will bring my salvation. This is what happened here. This is why God gave the, the, the believers here the Holy Spirit. It was a, a sign to, of judgment to unbelieving Israel. And when you look at the book of Acts, who were the guys that did the wonders and the miracles? Was it the ordinary believers? Or was it the apostles? Only a certain amount of people that could do these things. It was only the apostles. We, we find nowhere in the book of Acts that the believers did what Paul and Peter did. So the apostles that were chosen by God uh, went through these, through the, um, when they went out, the message they spread, the gospel they spread, was to validate God saying, all right, you see, I sent Peter, I sent Paul, Look what they are doing. It's the same message that Jesus brought. Jesus did signs and wonders, and the apostles did. So the signs and the wonders that happened in the book of Acts were only the apostles. And even when you read the book of Acts, you go a little bit further. You're in the middle of Acts, to the end of Acts. You see that it started fading away. The apostle Paul was at sea one night and one day. He did not pray to God to save him from the water. A snake bit him. He did not pray for healing. So even in the book of Acts, it seems like these things disappeared, but it was only the apostles that could do these things. Now, I'm not saying God cannot do these things. God can do what he wants whenever he wants, but it's not normative. The book of Acts should always be read as an historical book. It's not a normative practice 
what happened in Acts. We can't replicate what happened here in, in our time today. If, if we want to try and do this, we need to be 120 here. Only 120 Christians all over the world. We are more than that. And then there are millions of Christians. So I, just I got a little bit of the point there, but we should always remember the book of Acts is a historical account. It records the birth of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and the spread of the gospel. It's not normative for us today to try and replicate. But like I said, God can still use people to do certain things for him, but it's not a normative practice. And it's also interesting, uh, when you look at the book, of, the book of Acts, the tongue speaking only occurs two more times in the book of Acts. Only two more times. We only have the mention of tongues three times in the book of Acts. So we see here that it was not normative for everybody. Even the Apostle Paul said, not everybody will speak in tongues. So it's something to remember. And I know many people say, if you do not speak in tongues, you do not have the Holy Spirit. That's a lie. You cannot make a statement like that. Because many believers did not receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, sorry, many believers did not speak in tongues. You can see it in the book of Acts. The 3,000 that got baptized after Peter's sermon, we have no evidence that they spoke in tongues. So can we say they did not receive the Holy Spirit? No, we cannot say that. So we should always remember that the book of Acts, it's not a normative practice for us to try and replicate and do what they that it's an historical account. So what did, this, what did they speak here? What were they speaking here in Acts 2? They were proclaiming the mighty works of God done in the Old Testament times. This is what, have, this is what was happening there. So all these people, all these people that we had there in, in Acts 2 here, we had people from, from Medes, the Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, uh, Cappadocia. So the Gentiles, the 120, they were, they, oh, sorry, not Gentiles, they were Jews. All these other people were from the Gentile nations. So how was it possible that the Jews could speak their language? This is what was happening there. So the Gentiles saw, but I, these guys are Jews. How can they speak our languages? This is why I'm saying it was a known language. The Jews were speaking the known languages of the world to all the people that gathered there. This is how they could understand what they were saying. So we see here that they were speaking about the mighty works of God. And when we look at Scripture, there's so much more that the Holy Spirit does than just giving you the gift of tongues. We see that He empowers, He fills, He guards he sanctifies us. He calls us to ministry. He indwells us. He intercedes for us. Why always focus only on one thing? So many people focus only on the tongues. If I don't speak in tongues, uh, you know, I I'm not filled with the Spirit. But look how many things the Spirit does in our lives. And like I always say, Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23, is evidence of the Holy Spirit in your life. Do you have love? Do you have joy? Do you have peace? Do you have patience? Do you have kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control? Those are fruits of the Holy Spirit in your life. Not merely speaking in a tongue. We should always remember that, church. Always remember that. And we see that the Holy Spirit, he, he teaches. He produces fruit. This is what the Holy Spirit does. He regenerates. He convicts us of sin. He does so much more than just giving tongues to people. And sometimes I believe there's so much emphasis placed on one gift of the Spirit. And we have so many other left. That, we, that He can give to us and what He can do through us. And like Paul said, not all will speak in these languages, these tongues. So here we have it in the book of Acts here too. These were known languages. The Jews were speaking the known languages of the world. 
This is how the Gentiles could understand what the Jews were saying. And this is what was happening here. It was to show that the gospel will now go to the ends of the world. So when we look at this, we see, and we should always remember, the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, but is also equal in power than God. He's the life giver. He's the advocate. He's the sanctifier. He's the anointer. And he's the illuminator. And all believers, all Christians, have the Holy Spirit living inside of them. Pentecost was an important event in the early church history. It marked the birth of the church and the Holy Spirit's present presence within it. However, it was a unique and unrepeatable event. And Christians today should not expect to experience it in the same way the early church did. Pentecost was necessary to the early church transition. And we should always remember that whatever we do, uh, whatever goes on inside of us, may it be that we do it to the glory of God. Because I've heard people say, I want the tongue so I can pray more. You're just focused on yourself. Why do you want to, so that you can pray more? No. Everything we do should be glorifying God, bringing Him honor, bringing Him glory in what we do. So let's remember this church always, like I always say, if you want to know if you have the Holy Spirit in your life, look at Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23. Yes, we maybe will not have all the fruits of the Spirit. We will maybe will be lacking in some areas of our lives. But the Spirit sanctifies us. He helps us to grow in those areas. Maybe you, sometimes I struggle with being impatient. He teaches me. He sanctifies me in that area uh, in my daily life. And so it's the same for all of us. So all of us have received the Spirit. We are without an excuse. If you are a Christian, if you profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Christ died on the cross for you and repented and turned away, you have received the Holy Spirit. There's no need to wait for a second experience or something. You have already received the Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you this morning, Lord, for, for this passage, God. And I, I pray this morning, Lord, that you will help us, Holy Spirit, that you will help us, that we will believe this truth, that we have received you already, Holy Spirit. We know that Scripture teaches us that we should be kept being filled with the Spirit. But that is what we do in our daily life, our time we spend with you, God, by praying, by reading Bible. And I pray today that you will keep on filling us, Holy Spirit, that you will help us to be disciplined in our, our time spent with you, God. Help us to apply these principles to our lives. Help us to acknowledge and believe which has been given to us already, that we will not seek experiences or, or other things outside of your word and outside of your will. I also pray this morning, God, that you will be with us in this coming week, that you will guard us, that you will give us peace, that you will give us joy, that your will be accomplished in our life and that your kingdom will come in our lives, Heavenly Father. I pray this morning that you will open our eyes of our heart to see you in the passages of Scripture, Heavenly Father, that we will see you. We've received the full account of who you are and how you want us to relate to you, God. I pray this morning that help us, Heavenly Father, help us to pursue you, even though we have hold of you, that we will not leave you, God, that we will focus on you, focus on finishing this race of faith that you have put in front of us. Lord Jesus, thank you for the, your promises. Thank you that all your promises came true and that we have part of this today as the body of Christ. Each one of us, we have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. We are the temple of God wherever we go. Help us to always remind ourselves that whatever we do, 
what we see, where we go, that we are a temple of God. You are good, God, and you will always be good, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of how we feel, regardless of what is going on. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.